welcome to Creative Block. We're your hosts, V. And Sean. We interview people in creative industries about their life, work, and hobbies while we doodle jam. We asked people on Twitter and Instagram if they had specific topics they wanted us to discuss, as well as some drawing prompts. Today, we have with us Alex Crocus. Wait, is it Crocus or Crocus? Oh, no, you nailed it. Not everyone nails it. Oh, it's Crocus. Alex Crocus! Hey! <laughs> Yo, what's up, everyone? <laughs> Yo, yeah. Uh, th thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for coming on the show. I'm I've, very excited. Yeah, I've seen your comics. Like, I've followed your comics for a really long time. Um, I'm always excited to have people on the show who do both comics and animation. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about both of this, these things with you and how you manage to balance it all out. Because <laughs> it is a lot of work doing comics and animation, especially because... You're based in, on the East Coast, right? Yes, uh, I live in Brooklyn. And you, your experience with animation, um, you say you're a director, and I believe that means that you oversee like the complete from start to finish product, right? Yes. Uh, which is very different from studio directors who are just kind of like either overseeing story a little bit. When I was an episode director, I was over overseeing only the boards, not the designs and everything. So can you like tell us a little bit more what it's like directing an animated short um, yourself? Um, for directing an animated short, you definitely have way more control. You have more power. You don't have to get approval from mm. uh, a supervisor above you. All those things rule. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, if, if you're um, someone who likes to execute like a vision that you have, being an indie director is great. Obviously, the biggest setback of it is you don't have a lot of money. Uh, you have to <laughs> you have to crowdfund yourself or you just have to work with friends or other people who are down to just draw something they're excited about. Um, yeah, if you have a vision and you don't want to wait for approval from anyone else, uh, indie directing is definitely the way to go. Oh, look at the little raccoon with the headphones. Uh what should I draw? Should I just like wing it? <laughs> you should just wing it. Yeah. You can draw whatever you want. And if you can't think of anything to draw, we do have some prompts there. If you if you All right. if any of those seem fun. If anyone's listening on Spotify or iTunes, just check out the YouTube uh, video where you can see his draw. Oh, you uh, gotta check out the YouTube. I've been <laughs> listening to Creative Block. I told you this already when I met you in person, V, but I've been listening to Creative Block for like the last two years. Um, I'm a big fan and it is an honor to be on this show with both of you. In fact, I'm just going to draw a big fan really quick and uh, <laughs> listeners can only, oh, whoops, all the, the blades should be facing the right way, but um <laughs> All listeners will only You're be able to see this amazing though. drawing of a fan if they listen to Creative Block on YouTube, because that's <laughs> all of the coolest fans. So I, I think this is a, this is a, a good example of how to practice being a director. You start drawing a fan, and then you give yourself notes. And pretend that you're your own coworker, and you say, "I drew that the fans facing the wrong way," and then you give notes. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> actually uh, really true. Because I feel like if you're, if you're working at a studio, your director would tell you that. But when you're yeah. an indie director, you're just yeah. really hard on yourself all the time. You got to give your own notes when you're an indie <laughs> director. No so, one is there to tell you that your drawing is bad. <laughs> How so, did you? Oh, no, no, oh, no, go, 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 B, B, B. No, no go, I was go. just going to say, you know, like, so I think this is really interesting because for me, like when I was up and coming in animation, I was like, uh, 
first I was like, I wanted to do comics. And then comics is really tough uh, as a career. So I was like, maybe I'll do animation because it's like a studio job. It's a little bit more like an office job. So I went to animation school and then went into the studio pipeline. But how for you, how, and I never imagined that could be like, there could be like indie directors and that animation could be indie, you know, during that process. So how did you kind of stumble upon that path, Alex? Like, did you know, were there like people you looked up to or like, did it just happen? <laughs> Run us through uh, yeah. that. <laughs> uh, well, when I was in high school, um, I wasn't very ambitious. Uh, I was an okay student, but I don't think I had like huge, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I grew up. I knew that I liked doodling and drawing and I did like two years of art classes in high school. I didn't like have a huge background in it, but I did love comics and I did love TV. I love Calvin and Hobbes. I love the early Simpsons. I love Donkey Kong country too. Um, so I just decided to like go to school for art cause I, I didn't really have like a, a vision really. Mm -hmm. um and where was uh school for you like uh, college um my parents told me that if I wanted to go to like a big prestige art school like SVA or RISD I would have to take on a bunch of debt mm -hmm. and uh they would be supportive but that's something that I would have to do and that terrified the shit out of me <laughs> uh and I wanted to go to school in New York uh, I grew up like an hour outside of New York City and I decided to go to a state school in New York City called the Fashion Institute of Technology. Mm -hmm. um, and they had a general illustration program. And uh, it seemed like I could either pick between general illustration or fine art. And I actually went for fine art first and found, oh, nice. out, and found out that everyone was just doing abstraction. And I was like, <laughs> okay, this, this isn't for me. I draw like sharks yeah. bursting out of the ground and attacking children. Uh, I, I, this is my fine put, art. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I remember uh, in my, my orientation week, I met some illustration majors and we did like the classic young artists getting to know each other activity of showing each other your sketchbooks. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 My, my buddy, Diane. Uh, looked at my sketchbook and was just like, bro, what the hell are you doing in fine art? All of this is <laughs> representational and stupid. <laughs> like, you should be an illustration. So um, I took her advice. Um, she was totally right. Uh, I found my people in the illustration department and um, I found myself having conversations that mostly had to do with like cartoons that I grew up with. And um, uh telling jokes and like making gags and just uh mm -hmm. being like communally creative with other people and it was definitely the right move um the illustration department at SV at FIT was mostly geared around editorial and book illustration at the time and that wasn't really my scene um i did the projects and the assignments and everything but i never really felt like i was going to be an editorial illustrator at the end of it. Um, mm. And I felt a little disenfranchised by that. And in my last semester, I wound up uh, drawing these really crappy GIFs on paper. I didn't like work digitally at all. Um, I had a couple of computer classes, but I was mostly just working in a sketchbook. Mm. Um, and yeah, I would just uh, do these like watercolor drawings on paper and then just make them into loops in Photoshop. And I liked, I liked the process of seeing something move and come to life. I never like animated mm -hmm. as like a child or anything. Mm -hmm. And on a lark, I uh, took up a classmate's offer to check out this like independent animated filmmaker studio who was just down the street from FIT. And, oh, cool. And uh, yeah, she was going there. And said, like, oh, I'm going to go see this animator studio. Do you want to come with? And this was, like, two weeks before we graduated. And I was just like, yeah, sure. I don't – I'm not doing anything. I finished my finals. 
and uh, it wound up being uh, Bill Plimpton Studio. Whoa. Who, what? Who, <laughs> who, I didn't, who I didn't even know, because, like, That's I, funny. you know, I just had, like, my head up my ass, like, for all of high school and college. Do you know what's funny, though? I Sorry to interrupt. Oh, I that's fine. Like, I feel like so many people find out about Bill Plimpton in college because yeah. that's when I found yeah. out about Bill Plimpton. And remember, I remember, like, he does a lot of tours because he's been in, in Paris a couple of times where he, like, he kind of, like, I don't know if it's part of his, like, uh, uh, financial strategy where he kind of like raises money for like yeah. his next short. Um, but I remember the first time he came over to Paris and everyone was like losing their minds, like <laughs> Bill Plimpton is here. Because, and then, and then, <laughs> yeah, because he's he's kind of the indie animation staple. So I think a lot of, uh, especially animation teachers teach yeah. his stuff because he's like the the OG like independent oh, animator. Yeah. yeah, that's true. That's yeah. so crazy though. What a what a friggin' like coincidence that he was just there. So yeah. how was that? <laughs> I, yeah, I was I was gonna say that like like <laughs> if someone was like, hey, you wanna come by? We're gonna go check out this animator studio. Now it would just be like, okay, so here's a room with a desk in it, <laughs> and there's like a poster on the wall. Yeah, uh, there, there's the animation studio. Hope you ha loved seeing it. Like, mm. I'm trying to imagine what that would be like now. Like it probably wouldn't be very interesting. <laughs> yeah uh he he still has a studio it's not in chelsea anymore i think it's uptown but uh mm. at the time uh we went in there like a, a few classmates went and uh he's got a little couch by the window and he just still draws everything on paper and he just does it on a clipboard with like his legs crossed like he's just like doodling and uh, i just thought that was so romantic like, whoa, I didn't know that you could just make films on paper still, and this guy mm -hmm. is doing it. Like, granted, he's got, like, a little team of um, people who are more tech-savvy than he is, like, scanning and, like, digitally mm -hmm. coloring his drawings. But mm -hmm. he found a way to just draw with pencil on Xerox paper for the entirety of his adult life and, mm -hmm. and make it work. Uh, I just thought that was, like, so cool when I was um a college senior and i just asked uh the producer uh des at the time are, are you guys taking interns and uh they said yeah do you know uh, adobe after effects and all i had to do was kind of exaggerate my experience with the software and i and i got it um, wow yeah. i love that you, yeah you gotta yeah, yeah sometimes you gotta you got to bluff a little bit. You gotta... Yeah. Yeah. You got to be like kind of forward. Like I wasn't told by a professor that Plimptoons was looking for interns. I just went in there and I liked it and I asked for it. And um, yeah. I, I feel like uh, studios, especially now, are not like accustomed to artists just confidently rolling up and asking for things <laughs> so, and, and also and and just maybe they've never had an artist lie to them before however i i do i do think it's not it's not a lie if if it's if it's telling the truth about a a version of you throughout time that does know you know what i mean like time is relative like you're 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 saying like yeah i know but you're speaking about the version of you you know, a year from now, who's an expert? Yeah, I think also, at the time, at least, I was, like, a little clueless. Uh, and I just rolled up and, and asked for things, not really knowing what the process was. But I, I think I kind of just cut the line that way. And <laughs> uh, it, it worked out great. And uh, I did that internship for, like, six six months. It was, like, a, a semester and oh nice was it paid can i no ask? it was not yeah. well yeah technically sense. i was given five dollars a day for lunch and i don't know if that's still the case there but at the time i wasn't mad about it because i was being taught how to animate and mm -hmm. in my experience i had to pay for school so I feel yeah. like five dollars for lunch would buy me one chicken nugget at, right now yeah yeah i would go to whole foods <laughs> And I'd buy two apples, 
and uh, maybe there'd be something else in my backpack, but I'm not going to talk about it on the podcast. Uh, don't steal, kids. Uh, <laughs> I like that you, d- you said that you weren't going to talk about it, but the, you did imply that you were stealing <laughs> and that you did steal, which makes it... <laughs> It doesn't matter what was in there. <laughs> um, I will say that the the Whole Foods hot bar is fire, and it continues to be. So you're just uh, shoveling hey. meatballs into your – loose spaghetti into your backpack? <laughs> yeah, Pockets. yeah. Just wear cargo <laughs> pants, and you can fill it with all of the falafel that you want. Low-key, right now, cargo <laughs> pants, fashion-wise, are coming back with teenagers. And oh, absolutely. <laughs> It, yeah, it is because... 100% a time to to be able to steal loose spaghetti and meatballs and shove them yeah. in your pockets. If you're yeah. a Gen Z listening to this podcast, this is your time to stop wearing cargo pants because the millennials have cracked the code. So we're all going to start wearing the cargo pants and it's, you know, not going to cargo cool pants anymore. make you look like <laughs> a gonna... cool ass character design who has so <laughs> many More pockets, who has so many gadgets. Yeah, you look like a Rob Layfield drawing. <laughs> I feel like for me, like cargo pants is like, you know, the animation dad staple where it's like the Hawaiian shirt, the cargo pants and the baseball hat. And then it's like, <laughs> you know, like you're the. My my take ah. on current fashion for teenagers is that they're like, it's like 90s fashion or like early 2000s fashion is coming back. But. It, it it's regardless of whether at the time that was viewed as a cool thing like so, oh, so like it could be jenko jeans it could be like uh cargo pants it, it doesn't matter if at the time it was considered lame like it's it's all sort of like coming back nostalgically or ironically oh absolutely i mean like chains are back too and that's like oh, just wallet that's chains just like, and shit. yeah that's just a love letter to uh the late 90s and early 2000s it's the same thing okay but like i will say i am partial to chains oh yeah <laughs> i like I the too. chains i'm wearing a chain and they right hope, now i really hope the t-shirt over long sleeves comes back <laughs> because i miss it so much uh you can be the change you want to see in the world be <laughs> and bring the but, chains uh... that you want to see Exactly. Actually, in an interview last night, um, my my band played a show, and uh, we got interviewed afterwards, and they asked us if uh if we had any ad- advice for people who were gonna come to shows or something like that, and I huh. said just bring a long chain to swing around because it looks. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that okay, yeah. sounds violent. <laughs> I did not yeah. bring give helpful answers in that particular interview. <laughs> Um, I'm going to, I'm going to take us all the way back to (laughs) to uh, stealing, um, (laughs) from the Whole Foods buffet. Um, (laughs) so (laughs) you spent six months at the internship. And so, well, you obviously learned after effects. Is there anything else that you, uh, you like learned or like thought was like eye opening, like really, like what are like all the. Things yeah. that you got from that internship. Uh, when I was at the internship, I um, scanned, cleaned, colored, and composited Bill's drawings. Like if he was doing like a like a walk cycle test for like a character for a short he was making, um, I would get like the the roughs, and then I would composite it for him just to uh, sequence all the drawings to make sure that it flowed the way that he wanted, and then he'd come over. And, like, scratch his chin and be like, huh, okay. And then, like, go back and, like, do, like, a final. And I thought it was great to learn just how to make, like, a four-frame walk cycle. Uh, Bill's very, very good at economic drawing, just, like, cutting every corner so mm-hmm. that only the the information that is needed yeah. is there. And that's how he's able to make like feature length films like all by himself. Is that are in very... color and they're and they're yeah. shaded and they're yeah. 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 Um to be fair, uh he usually doesn't do like the, the color and shading. Oh okay. Yeah, at the time there was like a team of like six people who did all the coloring and he just did the 
like the pencil drawing and like like light shading that just gives texture to the to, to the art. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, in those six months, I learned how to like composite films in After Effects and make like little loops and yeah, have enough experience and knowledge to uh, like make shorts on my own. And while I was like interning there, I sorry, man, drawing while talking is it's hard. hard. Yeah. I wanted it's to really draw. Hard. I wanted to draw a metalhead swinging a chain around because uh, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> that that show you played sounded cool. Well, just to be clear, no one was swinging a chain. I just thought it would be funny to say to that swing a chain looked cool. <laughs> uh, you're not wrong. But... <laughs> Um, but yeah, at that time, uh, I interned three days a week and I worked at a cheese shop for the other four days of the week. So I, I worked every day, um, and uh, I played in a touring folk punk band. Oh, nice. Uh, and I think that scratched my like indie director DIY itch before I started making films. And, uh, Oh, so you started with music videos or something? Yeah, yeah. The first film I made was a music video for my band that uh, was all rotoscoped, um, uh, which is just tracing over live footage for for those who don't know. And I thought that was like a really easy way to get better at animating because all of the information is there. Yeah. And uh, me and my band recorded a video of us playing along to one of our songs and I kind of like storyboarded where the camera should be at certain times and then we printed out every frame of that recording Mm -hmm. in like this big stack and we split it up six ways and I mailed a sixth with a pad of tracing paper to every member of the band because we all lived in different parts of the country and they traced those frames and then mailed it back to me that's and so comp- crazy. And I composited all of it, and I just oh crossed my, my fingers, being just like, "Oh my god, <laughs> I hope this syncs up. Oh my god, I have no idea if this is gonna work." But it it <gasps> sequenced fine, because like I said, with rotoscoping, all the information is there already. You don't have to edit or time anything. And I love that you were just like. Yeah, you actually a stand, you know, like I'm gonna mail it all in, like, cause what year was this, like? potentially could have been done on the internet right oh or... yeah well <laughs> you know I, i'm i'm dating myself right now but i think this was like 2013 um i feel like google drive wasn't quite there yet mm. and um none of the other members of my band like identified as visual artists uh so <laughs> i i was just like here are the frames and tracing paper and if you put it on like a sheet of glass that you take out of a framed photo, you could uh-huh. put it in front of a lamp, like over your lap, and like use that as a light box. It was like very, um, very really punk cool. for lack yeah, of a that's, better word. <laughs> that's what I was gonna say. I feel like, do you feel like kind of the punk philosophy helped you in that is instance? I kind of make a thing because it's just like ah who cares there's not really like any you know you don't have that voice in your head telling you like it has to be the specific way and this is what it has to you be know. a portfolio piece like this has right? to be like yeah. a beautiful fine art thing yeah i think at the time i didn't prioritize making a portfolio at all uh i i was just like i want a fire music video and I know that the most successful music videos are ones that feature the bands. Like everyone just, people just want to like look at other people. It's so boring. And I, <laughs> I, I wanted it to be animated. Um, and my bandmates were really cool and they like creatively trusted me. And when I was like, I really want this to be animated. And if we animate it, it'll be really, really cool. And everyone was down. And maybe it was just because we were uh, young and in our 20s and we had time to piss away. Um, we were all down to to 
to animate like a four minute video together. And yeah, uh, I stupidly put it on Vimeo and not on YouTube. And I think it would have uh, been distributed a little bit more if it were on YouTube, but uh, it's still there on Vimeo. You can Google Wood Spider Hot October if you want to see it. I'm still proud of it. There aren't a lot of things that I've done a decade ago where I'm I'm still proud of it, but I think that music video and that last album uh, still hits. Uh, that's that's yeah. so cool. I can't wait to watch that. Um, <laughs> that's so fun. I feel like how and has like uh, when you've made this video, has it done like anything for you in terms of like like did it either just kind of make it all click like oh this is what I want to do or have you used that video kind of like looking for jobs or was it just like oh this was fun I did this like um I, I think I did one more music video um after that uh me and my partner at the time uh Kay who I met at Plimtoons uh, made a music video for another band, and that one's also, I think, still cool. It's for a band called Blackbird Rom, and I think between those two music videos and uh, a bunch of gifts that I made, I was able to cut, like, a crappy little reel, um, which was just, like, you know, like, the the good shots of the, of the videos and uh, some, like, flashy loops that could maybe be perceived like they were a part of a bigger thing, but like no one has to know that. <laughs> yeah, that's the dope <laughs> thing about gifts, though. Yeah. That's that's the yeah. best part about putting gifts in your reel and using because you can basically say like, okay, I'm I, maybe I'll even make a little background. It'll even look like a whole finished <laughs> shot. No one knows where it's coming. No one's looking this up. No. Uh, yeah. I feel like producers who are hiring animators are not checking the credits of everything in the time code. No. <laughs> the, the the clip just has to look good and uh, convey that you know how to animate. And it doesn't really matter if it was for, like, a TV show or it was for, like, a McDonald's ad. You just have to, like, prove that you're competent and you know what you're doing and it looks clean and good. Yeah. Uh, that's my experience, at least. Um, I never had... True. I feel like that's, real, that's true for any part of the industry you know I feel like it's it's true like as an indie animator but it's also true as a uh, like a studio animator I think that's like great advice you know like showing that you can do it I'm watching your video by the way it's fucking <laughs> cool dude I feel like yeah this is really cool thanks thanks uh yeah for a first film um I'm proud of it and there's also like the sentimentality in it for me where sure. you know I see like the drawings that uh you know like my friend like Esteban made and I'm just like oh yeah that's such an Esteban drawing because uh, <laughs> um anyone anyone is able to trace with rotoscoping like it's a great way to start and mm -hmm. everyone has like a signature like mark to how they yeah. make a line so like I I can like identify like everyone's drawings very easily in that uh it's, it's like a photo of them. Aww, but I'm nice. I'm not trying to get too schmaltzy on the podcast. <laughs> no, feel no, free. Really feel cool. free. We're walking down memory lane right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hope this origin story isn't going on too long, but uh you can edit the hell out of this, I'm sure. Uh, make your journey smaller. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Make your journey shorter, because uh, we have to end this podcast. No, I'm just. Uh, uh, I, I, we want you to talk. Um, this is all very good. Your journey, your journey is valid. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for accepting me. <laughs> uh, and I, um, so, so you were like cutting together that little reel, and uh, at when, at what time were you doing this, uh, cutting the reel, and were you? like where were you sending it out um and so i'm kind of like leading to the question that's like how did you land your first game yeah <laughs> yeah so um i made i made a bunch of friends at that internship just because like i don't know i'm yappy and i uh <laughs> i put myself out there 
I ask if people have ever been on the roof of the building and they say no. So I say like, do you want to see if we can get on the roof? And then you go up there and you smoke weed with people and then you just become friends. You exchange Instagrams, you stay in each other's orbit. And uh, so I was friends with a few people for a few years. I feel like I, I left that internship at the end of 2012 and I was just making films and, and loops for a couple years. Uh, I sold cheese and uh, I went on tour a lot. What, what yeah, is, wait, I, hold on. <laughs> you sold cheese. Where did you, you sell the cheese? Over that. Yeah, yeah, I was a, I was a cheese a monger street, a, while like I was on the street, like at your pocket, <laughs> I mean, no. at oh, the cargo I'll show you the cargo pants pocket. Yeah, my my first cheese job was working for a farmers market. There was like a like a organic cheese farm, like in upstate New York, that I I just was the vendor for at like different markets. And I did that when I was in college. And when I was interning and I needed a job because surprise, surprise, you can't live on $5 a day uh, from your internship. You so need more I, than I, one I, chicken nugget a day. To I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just got like a food service job, but I, I liked working in cheese. So I just applied to like four or five different, cheese monger jobs in new york city Wait, there's just multiple i've never heard of yeah multiple there's... cheese there's multiple <laughs> cheese monger jobs that you can get yeah yeah i mean a lot of like fancy grocery stores have you know the cheese counter yeah where you yeah. get your your gruyeres and your camemberts uh your your Delice de Bourgogne. If, 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 so, sorry, small tangent. If you were yeah. to make a charcuterie plate with some cheese right now, to, if guests were mm -hmm. coming over, yeah. what would you what would you pick out for uh, for a nice rounded plate? Yeah, I've done this a lot, um, and I feel like you should always have a cow, a goat, yeah. and a sheep, uh, because it just you get to compare, you get to uh, see how uh, creaminess and flavor profiles are affected yeah. by the animal that it comes from. Um, I like to do like a double cream. Uh, v probably knows all about that because the French love double creams. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, that'll, that'll usually be my cow's milk. Um, I like to do like a fresh goat, uh, like a chev of some sort. Um, a Humboldt fog is like a very accessible crowd pleaser. Everyone loves it. And uh, the sheep, I like to do something like kind of aged. Maybe like, yeah, yeah uh, now, usually now, something do you, Italian. Do you, do you prefer a um, a meat to go with it? Or, or do, do you also you, you have like a jam or a honey or something like that? Uh, a hot honey is fun. Um, a jam is also fun. But I usually just go for... Uh, cheese charcuterie uh prosciutto has to be nice. on the board um and then like uh, like a salami of some sort and then i'll do yeah. dried fruit and like marcona almonds like some kind of nut uh yeah. and it, it could be a little pricey but if you're smart and know how to cut corners you can make like a nice cheese and charcuterie board for maybe like 30 bucks and oh if, and yeah. if you're having like a a nice night with friends you can do that, and then you tell them to get the wine, and uh, it's like an equal exchange. Yeah. It's yeah. So, sorry for this very classy tangent, but <laughs> I, I thought it was Oh, important. no, that's okay. <laughs> so, so, so yeah. che cheesemonger, you, you were you're working at like five cheesemonger, you were a cheesemonger connoisseur, well, I, knew the whole industry. How, yeah. It, I, how, I, what I was your applied. transition into, what was your transition <laughs> into uh, animation? Like, what was your first, uh, how'd you get your first animation job? Yeah, so while I was working at that cheese shop, cheese job and, like, taking breaks to go on tour, I would reach out to producers and directors in New York City, either through recommendations of, like, the friends that I made at that internship, or if you see, like, if I saw, like, a short film that I liked and I thought it was beautiful and... 
kind of worked in a style that I could do where at the time, like I mostly worked traditionally. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just making like messy rotoscope drawings and like watercolor loops. And if someone like did something that seemed like it was on paper, I would look at the credits. Um, I know I just said no one looks at the credits, but I looked at the credits and I would see who the director was or who the producer was. And I would see if their email was accessible, like through their studio's website. And usually the producers wasn't, but the director's was. Interesting. I uh, think this is, yeah, this is such a cool, cool, cool uh, advice. Like I think definitely like this is something to do, like looking up the credits and then looking up the artists, because that's also how you grow your network and just also, and also more generally, your artistic sensibility because then you can you start like to kind of like follow them look at their career and all that but um yeah sorry for interrupting i thought that oh, was just no. a really cool that's a really cool thing to do and to get in the habit of doing yeah i found out that a lot of directors are freelance um even if they are like in the roster of the studio's directors so they are looking for work and they want mm. to be contacted easily mm. so their their emails are just like hanging out there and they are rarely approached for casting or being hired. And I just reached out to the directors who I genuinely liked and said, hey, I love your work. I would love to just be a part of like the next like music video that you make. And um, some were down to hire me because uh, I think like they're not burnt out on people genuinely reaching out and saying like i love what you do uh can you bring me on your next project i think that it doesn't happen very often mm -hmm. and um the first person who responded to me was benji brook who oh, is really amazing director uh gets better every single year is capable of things that i didn't think were possible and all i just did was tell him that his short power hungry was sick and i would love to be involved at some point and even if he didn't have anything for me at that time he responded very sincerely went through my website screen cap things that he liked and said like i love all this stuff and uh benji and i are like friends to this day just because i reached out and was like real and genuine uh, i love that That's and like i uh, I wound up helping him on the the animated song that he did for the Teen Titans Go movie, the, oh, the Robin song. What? You're you're on that? That's yeah. fucking awesome, yeah, dude. Yeah, I I did roughs for some of the shots in that music video. Um, I didn't I didn't do the the highly memed uh, butt shaking one. Uh, Kay <laughs> did that one. Um, but but you're t you're talking about the one that's in the movie, right? Yeah, yeah, for yeah. The movie. That's by the way, uh, anyone listening, if you haven't seen the Ten Times Go movie, at least check out this sequence because it's like it's really really cool. It's like artistically, it's so fun. There's like how many different styles in it? Like at least ten. Yeah. Or something different. Yeah, it switches up a lot. Yeah. So oh, we so we have cool. technically both worked on Ten Times Go, which is uh, <laughs> which is cute. Technically, maybe coworkers. I don't know what you call that. <laughs> Uh, we're no, we're we're working together right now. That's true. We're both we're both uh, here, and time is money, and we're both spending that time together. So we're, <laughs> we're getting paid overtime. Uh, I'm stealing that for the future. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah. So I reached out to Benji. I reached out to uh, this other director, uh, Jordan Bruner, who's another like amazing indie director, and yeah, she did a, a Paramore music video that was really cool. And I just reached out, said something similar. To like, I, I genuinely like this and I would love to work with you. And uh, she brought me on to a job she was doing for Google. And Google's sponsor us. Uh, yeah, please sponsor <laughs> yeah, Creative Google. Block. <laughs> Google, if you're listening, uh, m Mr. Michael Google, head of Google, Mr. Hans uh miss mrs susan google i don't know if you're listening right now 
Let's my creative longer. path was possible thanks to Google. <laughs> Google, making dreams come true. We're literally using Jamboard every single episode. This is a Google <laughs> product. We're That's like true. already working free for anyhow. Oh, I haven't, end of this tangent. We used, I haven't we drawn used, anything in a while. Let me draw a fish. We're uh, um, we're all working together on the trash cafe. Um, Sean drew oh a God. huge dumpster for <laughs> us, and now we could just have little critters in there. It's amazing. <laughs> Damn, y'all are making me feel like I still work traditionally because I can't find these. Ar oh, oh, here they are. All right. Oh, this is nice. <laughs> Damn, this is like, like the indie studio of my dreams. <laughs> it's just in a dumpster. Uh, yeah, the, the modded dumpster. It's like uh, shipping containers eat your heart out. We've, we've got uh, an entry point already. Right. Yeah. Uh, like, I mean, no, I was gonna go on a huge tangent, but I want to take it back to um, you like looking up um amazing directors that you were looking up to oh um, yeah so uh, the, yeah yeah jordan was my first job that didn't suck um or she like she hooked it up and i was just like her assistant for that and i uh i i, I kind of just like animated uh, i i did some designs but it was a mixture of animating and photoshop and after effects and mm. I feel like a lot of indie directors who especially work in ads, they just have their style and their process and they do it the way that they need to. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they just find assistants who can work in that style. Like mm -hmm. it's not super streamlined. It's just make sure the final product is good. And if you have like a charming, quirky way of working, that's all your own. It's like, okay. So mm -hmm uh yeah i like i learned how i learned how jordan worked and i thought that was cool because that was just me like learning more mm -hmm. uh sorry i'm doing i'm drawing someone doing a, a child's pose on a yoga mat because uh, I, I was hoping he was okay i was like maybe he's passed out I love, you know, people, he's doing great. <laughs> I love when people apologize for drawing on this podcast <laughs> uh but yeah my first bad job was shortly before that and it was actually why i quit my cheese job because i was like okay i got the job like i'm good mm. and uh it was to do rotoscoping for an indie film mm -hmm. and uh it was just, just up your alley yeah yeah i thought like okay this isn't my wheelhouse like i can mm -hmm. do this i don't really know animation principles that well but i can i can trace stuff <laughs> i know that yeah <laughs> uh so i I took this job for like a f indie feature length film that was kind of doing like a Rob Bakshi kind of thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, where it's just a lot of um, traced live footage and you got paid per second of animation. So the faster you work, the less embarrassing the pay is. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really hard. Um, I was working it's on a, a tablet. Yeah. It's a lot of work. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's truly mindless, grueling labor. There are some people who like that. Like, they just like to enter, like, this, like, zen state. Mm -hmm. And they, like, yeah. they slam three audiobooks. And yeah. they, yeah, they yeah. just, like, work for, like, 12-hour periods. I can't mm -hmm. really do that. I, I can enter the Zen state, but um, sometimes it's hard to achieve. I was working on a tablet and it, it wasn't cutting it. So mm -hmm. I went to this uh, beloved but now defunct tech store in Manhattan called TechServe, hmm. where they have uh, Cintiqs, you know, like the big, the big uh, monitors that you can draw on set up so you could just try them out. Mm -hmm. And I rolled, I rolled up with a thumb drive of my working files and I put it on the working computer and I just used the sample Cintiq for like a day. And Wait, like I you just stood there, you just stood in there and you worked on their computer. I, I it's just, like the equivalent of like going to Barnes and Nobles to read manga, but yes, this yes. one is. <laughs> yeah. I'm just using resources and facilities 
I love uh, it. without paying for it. It's not that different from the hot bar, to be honest. <gasps> uh, but I I worked on that for a day. I I timed how fast I could work on a Cintiq as opposed to a, a tablet. And whenever uh-huh. like a an employee came up to me and was like, "Sir, do you need help with anything?" and I was like, "No, I'm just trying this out." And <laughs> And Did you have, uh, like a different employee check just there for hours. <laughs> yeah, there were a couple. I don't think hey, I'm I had changing shit. Do... <laughs> yeah, I don't think I had anything to do with uh, tech or going out of business because I did buy the Cintiq. Nice. Because you know I was I timed myself and I worked yeah. twice as fast as I did on the Cintiq than I did on a tablet, and I was like. Dude, this is so true. Like, this is so true. I remember my first job, I only had the tablet and I kept telling myself, I was like, I'm never going to work on a Cintiq because I know the day I'm going to work on a Cintiq, I'm not going to be able to go back. And I was still like struggling with money. So, um, but the second job I got, they gave us Cintiqs and I was like, fuck. And then, that, and then I did the same thing. I realized like, holy shit, I'm drawing so fast. And I was like, I can't go back. It's yeah. literally, it's literally twice as fast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I have professional friends who work on tablets and they make it work. Um, mm-hmm. and, and God bless them. That's good for them. That's great. I'm glad they didn't have to throw down a fat stack on an expensive monitor, but I did. I had to. <laughs> uh, and I had some money saved up from, uh selling cheese and living with eight people so my cost of living was low at the time and i was able to save some money and i bought the Cintiq. nice and it made that rotoscoping job like possible Mm -hmm. i still hated it i still hated (laughs) every single second of it and there was eventually a time where like i had to tap out and i was like it's not worth me struggling to like make minimum wage for this job uh yeah. so I, you know everyone has a limit did, uh, did you like do you feel like you learn from it though do you feel like you kind of there was like a positive takeaway from the job or was it was it just like <gasps> never again i think you know it, it's it's like a lot of my early experiences um working on indie projects in new york that everyone has a different way of working Mm-hmm. and it's cool to just experience another one but that was a way of working that i didn't like <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and yeah sometimes yeah. that's just as valuable of an experience knowing what you like and what you don't like because sometimes you don't know until you try it yeah. and uh and sometimes the only benefit that comes out of a job like that is just like recognizing that like okay what i'm doing it takes a long time to do and I'm like building up that tolerance. And so sometimes working a job that's really grueling, that takes a long time to draw everything and whatever, sometimes that's going to make you uh, better later, like just Mm -hmm. for knowing how to do that. And also, also just like, I don't know, I've found personally, like being on jobs that made me feel horribly depressed. Uh, I, it's kind of, it's a good way to kind of like learn how to know yourself you know you're like oh well this was just like a really bad fit and I just like am going to avoid these jobs from now on uh and I think even though (laughs) the way it's it's a long way to get to that realization but it's once you get that you it makes your life so much better (laughs) that makes sense yeah no it does I, I I definitely got things from that job uh, but I, I think I hit like a, a ceiling for what there is to learn. And from here on out, it's just tedium. Yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. um, I think that if you're not being paid well yes. and you're not learning anything yep. and you're not feeling creatively fulfilled, you got to leave. True. Yes, very true. Yes. Because, you know, we, we love to get paid to draw. It's sick. Uh, we're living the dream for our childhood selves, but mm. there are easier ways to make money, and uh, you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to suffer. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. It is. You true. can go into I'm... cheese, and yeah, you can go into cheese. <laughs> Granted, Whole Foods is putting out a lot of the specialty cheese shops in New York City out of business because, like, they have a pretty decent cheese counter. 
Um, so mm-hmm. those jobs aren't as available, but uh, th- you could you could do something else too. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. Um, while I was freelancing for like the first couple years, uh, I worked farmers markets. Mm-hmm. I would like do deliveries for like an organ two farms, one in upstate New York and one in Connecticut. Uh, Mm -hmm. I did deliveries and I worked farmers markets and honestly that was like that was like the purest work I ever did because like I knew where my labor was going Mm -hmm. it was going to um, these two farmers who I really respected the work of Um, Mm -hmm. and I and yeah all I knew where all the money was going uh, I ate better than I ever did in my entire life because like, like two I chicken got, nuggets? it was bet <laughs> no well I I I would get chicken nuggets that was uh made by like a, a guy who has a farm upstate and he like raised free range chicken with his hands yeah and he breaded the chickens with like organic flour it was it was there's nothing like e- eating a chicken nugget and you can taste the farmer's hands exactly on the chicken nugget. Yeah, I I tasted farmer's hands every day for months for years. Farmers farm to table. It, it, you can taste the fingers. That's the slogan. Yeah. All jokes aside, though, I do agree that there is something that's really nice when you are working for um when the work you do like you you understand the result of it like right away. Like I feel like sometimes working these like like at like animation animation jobs it's like you can get like really disconnected to what the work actually is or like who would benefit so i um i i relate to that um i think that's a great that's a great point um and... yeah uh i i was really happy with my arrangement where i did freelance advertising jobs like Monday through Friday, maybe on the weekends if the production was crazy. And I would just work my market jobs like Saturday and Sunday morning. Uh, Mm. I was very generous with my food. I would just like make make dinner for my friends all the time because I just got free food. It just made me it made me like a more generous person because like my needs were met and I didn't have to like hoard my groceries like I did when I was in college. And, uh, yeah, it was great. Um, I, uh, it was, yeah, it was a good arrangement and I'm only bringing this up. So I don't know, people who feel like complicated over like not drawing full time. Yeah. Don't, don't have to feel that way. Sorry. That wasn't a really uh, complete sentence, but I hope all the important words were there. No, I agree. I think this is great. I feel like uh, it's funny because I've kind of noticed this meme making the rounds on like Twitter and Instagram that says like, uh, if art isn't your main income, that doesn't mean you're not an artist. And I really agree with that sentiment is like you can be an artist, even if you're doing other things on the side to to, like, uh, make your income full. And I think that's I wish that was like a, I don't know, a philosophy that was like a little bit more mainstream in like art schools or whatever, uh, or like that would, I don't know. Oh, yeah. I, there, I are, there are a lot you of know? people that that are happy making films or, or, or making uh, art pieces for fun outside of their regular jobs. And they don't have that, like their whole livelihood doesn't depend on whether they do this art piece or not. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that is a perfectly respectable way to, to I mean, it starts out as a hobby for all of us and it doesn't need yeah. to to get money attached to it if if you don't want it to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, you and, usually yeah. get get good when you're not being paid for it. To be yeah, honest. That's the other thing. Yeah. That's the yeah. other like thing. Like developing is, I, I think your you, voice mm-hmm. because yeah. you because you're just like enjoying yourself and you're either like making a comic or you're working on like a a film. I think you get better by working for it because sometimes it forces you to draw when you don't want to. Mm-hmm. And like being yeah. employed is good for that. That's a valuable skill. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think you make the good shit, not because there's like an employer wagging a finger at you. You, you make it because 
you have an idea that you're excited about. I think yeah. there's something to be said about um, uh, attaching uh, a, a money stressor to it very early on before you're like ready to have because like attaching money to it uh, is already it's it's putting a value on your artwork that some people aren't ready for you. Like some people need to like figure out what their art style is or like they need to learn more or and atta attaching money to it really early i think can be kind of detrimental because it, it uh it funnels people into what makes money like like yeah. it, it, mm -hmm. it might it might mean like okay i only, I only ever draw pinups because <laughs> sex sells you know what i mean yeah. or i only ever draw fan art ever because that's yeah. what does well on social media and gets me jobs um I, yeah, I think it's the same thing with social media. I feel like so many people just consolidate everything they do to one style because that's what gets the highest engagement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it, they restrict themselves from experimenting and learning new things because they feel like if they post it, maybe it won't get as many likes and uh, that'll be embarrassing. And uh, I, I feel like it's... There's a parallel there, I feel. <laughs> no, I agree. I yeah. think, yeah, like, it's just, like, kind of, I think the thought is there's different ways of of value, of finding value in your art. And uh, ideally, as an artist, you want to, you want the value you find in your art to be, like, the the challenges or the happiness or, like, the, the self-fulfillment quality it gives you like that's that's like in an ideal happy place but a lot of people kind of or like a lot of artists and myself included you know like when you're on a journey of finding what is the value you put into art you can get sidetracked by like likes and follows or money because these are currencies that um uh, translate into into like a commodity so obviously you know money it's like you can buy stuff but like uh likes it's like exposure so uh yeah that makes a lot of sense like it's like trying to find the, the pure value in your art that's uh that can be a struggle and it takes well, a speaking some... yeah uh, speaking of, speaking of pure value um in your work <laughs> and like and like developing your own style you are somebody that uh, a, along with directing and paid gigs, does a, a fairly frequently uploaded comic, and uh, and you mm -hmm. express yourself fairly re frequently with your own art style. When did you start implementing that, and how has balanced that with your other paid work um, been for you? Uh, I think I'm definitely the best known for my web comics. Um, and I think the way that I have been able to pump them out so frequently is because I I don't get worried about like the money part of it. Uh, mm -hmm. I I have like almost exclusively for the last five years drawn my loud and smart comics, like you know on lunch breaks or mm -hmm. like I roll up to a bar before like my friend does and I just draw a comic to like kill the time and then when i i used to i used to just take a photo of them with my phone and just blast mm -hmm. the contrast out of them and then i just like <laughs> mm -hmm. shit it out comic. on instagram and yeah, like yeah. i i was very uh uh very laissez-faire about it and mm -hmm. i think that helped keep my output consistent because at that time, when I was, like, figuring out, like, a clean, easy-to-draw, fast style, I didn't want to get, like, worried about, like, scanning everything and then, like, editing it and then, like, sending it over to my phone so I could post it on Instagram. I just, like, wanted as few, like, obstacles in front of me. Yes. And mm -hmm. I – it was just important that I figured out a process that I enjoyed every step of. So I never viewed it as work. And I, yeah, I, I, I did that. I think I started doing that in like 2016, which was like shortly after I started freelancing. Mm. And I think that like the, 
the validation of getting steady drawing work and being like, oh, I'm like a guy who draws for a living. I'm feeling myself. I'm just going to draw all the time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I found out that the four panel format like clicked with me. It looked good on Instagram. It's just a square. It fit into a square at the time. And then when Instagram dropped carousels, it, it was over. I uh, like just being able to just do slideshows mm -hmm. uh, really complemented the way that I worked. And mm -hmm. I just happened to find a style that worked for the format, which is social media. And I made work that looked good on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, people just started liking and commenting things more and i know i vilified it earlier but it did it, ga it gave me a little momentum to uh keep going and i think even if uh the algorithm does me dirty tomorrow and i get two likes on everything for the rest of forever i'm still gonna draw comics yeah i, I what you're saying is like so true i feel because it's funny because somebody ugh, what did i i think it was in an interview online that Dasha gave and he was like drawn comics is like a higher calling and it's something that I kind of like hear from a lot of creators and I'm like it is true like no matter what happens at the end of the day we'll still draw comics because we love drawing comics oh, so you, you know <laughs> no matter what happens because it's that thing where it's just like kind of scratches that itch of like you know something that you own something that's like self-expression too and it's just I don't know Oh yeah. Um I think I could I think I can speak for the entire comics community and industry when I say that no one got into it for the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh there are highly successful comic artists that are millionaires because they're like amazing at what they do, but I don't think that they got into it because like they wanted to be a millionaire yeah do you know how many all-nighters they they probably pulled <laughs> like like drawing like trying to get like five pages done in a inked in a day of like the hulk or, or some shit yeah oh but that being said I, I we got a comment recently that was like this podcast used to um uh uh talk talk badly about all-nighters and i'm scared about the way that this is going because the last podcast we were talking about how many all-nighters we pull we don't like it i don't <laughs> like it <laughs> i don't no, yeah. i don't like it and i don't support it but it is something that when you're freelancing and you're sometimes you're working a job and sometimes you have to work two jobs on top of one another there yeah. are a lot of a lot of late nights where you're working 12 to 16 hours plus trying to meet a deadline but yeah, yeah. I think... anyway a little tangent sorry uh oh you go v <laughs> no i was just gonna say it's it's true unfortunately i feel like like if obviously everybody should try their best to avoid doing all-nighters uh i but also i don't want to dunk on all-nighters too much because some of the way people work sometimes like I've had I have friends who like they can't really get to work until they're like really close to the deadline and it's just like their way of working and it's like you know like they don't do anything for like five days and Chronic then the last procrastinators, yeah. <laughs> yeah and it's you know and it's yeah. like eh, it's I don't know brains work differently and sometimes if that's the way uh you know, no matter how much time, I don't know, you can get on an assignment. Sometimes I, I work that way sometimes. Like when I have to put up a page, a comic page, and mm -hmm. I'm like, I really need to post today because I haven't posted in a couple of days and the algorithm's going to out to get me. So I'm just like, all right, I'm doing it now. But uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm Alex, how do you approach crazy deadlines? Like, do, do you, are you a, very regimented scheduled person are you like down to the last minute like freaking out what how do you deal with it uh i give myself like a a, like a seven out of ten for being organized nice. uh i'm o I, i'm That's okay good, yeah. i'm okay yeah. i i get the job done um sometimes 
I don't get paid very well for a job and I don't like it, but it means that they only get me for so many days. Um, mm-hmm. Like even if they give me a week's notice saying they need blank by Friday and they're offering X amount of money, I try and calculate like all of my animation work into day rates. Mm. So I'm like, okay, if you're paying me this much, that is like two days of work. So I will be on call and accessible for Thursday and Friday, and I will deliver like end of day Friday. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I was only really able to get to that point of being able to calculate what I can get done in a day by being kind of on top of scheduling and being consistent. Mm. So sometimes saving things to the last minute is just how I restrict myself from like working more when I'm not being paid enough to work more. Yeah. Uh, does that make sense? It makes that, a lot of sense. Lot and I think that's, sense. and that's really smart because I do feel like that's a problem that a lot of artists struggle with uh, myself, even, you know, like when you, yeah, you, you get X amount of money, you get X amount of time and then you're, you have to make that money work right you you can't just look at the deadline and be like i'm gonna just deliver the um, the best thing that they've ever seen in their entire life no matter how much i get paid like i think there's a there is a little bit of like yeah. being realistic about the value you give your work yeah, yeah. I, I think that's really yeah. smart I, I think that there's like for instance this week i i have one very time consuming job and then i have freelance also and I'm probably going to get one one day this week to work on that freelance, and mm-hmm. I have to, and I'm just going to have to get as much done possible on that yeah. freelance, wh- whether that means I stay up all night or not, you know. And mm-hmm. and I mean I've been, I I I've been like working overnight to finish projects since I was in high school. It, it's a very it's a very like as far as like myself, it's a very normalized thing uh and and like i uh it, it's a certain it, it, it's a certain secret power like superpower that i have like i like it, ri- i don't want to risk glorifying it too much but it is something that like if you are somebody that knows that secretly you can in 24 hours turn out an incredible amount of work if you need to it is it is like a, a like a secret weapon uh, that yeah you, you carry. yeah just don't don't i feel like don't lean on your maximum potential no 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 it's uh, true it's yeah. true yeah it's true yeah i agree I, with everything you're saying yeah i was gonna say yeah i think it's like yeah it's just like you know break the um the um, glass in case of emergency <laughs> yeah, yeah that's kind of what how i see it <laughs> A bit of advice I give a lot of creative people when they hit me up about uh, what to charge Mm. for rates or anything and whether it's like people doing like sound design or people doing animation or people doing comics is that the first thing you need to know as a professional is know how long it takes you to make something. Yeah. Yes. Because then you can like calculate your you know, your, like, hourly rate or your day rate or um, figure out, like, a flat rate and you'll know how long it takes you to do that. If someone comes to you and says, I need, like, a painting uh, and I have $300, if you know that it takes you three hours to make a painting, then, like, that's, like, $100 an hour that you're getting paid and that's like that's a pretty good deal yeah um so the first thing you have to know kind of comes from uh the unpaid labor of learning how long it takes you to make the thing that the people want yeah exactly yeah yeah and that part's hard like i don't know if you're just gonna have a stopwatch or something but that's the first thing that you should learn. Th- that's str- it's that's just straight up yeah. quantity of experience, like like having like because it's not just knowing how long it takes you to do a picture. If you're in animation, it's how long does it take to make a 15 second thing? How long does it take to just do the storyboards? How long does it take to do something where you have to direct it, storyboard it, and animate it? 
how long like like or just animation or just mm -hmm. like a comic mm -hmm. or just an illustration i think that it's um it's sort of like mentally logging like okay so i did this project back then uh it took me about a week to do the storyboards and then three weeks to animate it uh so that yeah yeah i mean like you're just drawing on previous experiences yeah and sometimes you're gonna make mistakes like i feel like there's a project i don't know i feel like oh yeah like something that i started doing recently which is it's like when i'm like i think it'll take me like 15 hours to do this now i'm like okay i'm gonna add five hours on top of this because i always overestimate my abilities i think as people that's kind of like a flaw it's just a human flaw we tend to think that we're better at things than what we actually are so it's always good to add a little bit like double um, it yeah oh yeah. yeah there there have definitely been times where i overestimated what i could get done in a certain amount of time and uh it was a humiliating and humbling experience because, like, I I was doing a, a a short film for 23 and Me, and uh, they they kind of like lowballed me a number for what for uh, a short film, and I was like, I never did something on this scale before, but I think that like I can I can hold this down and. And, you know, I said yes to it. And although I, I should have been paid a lot more, I was just like, yeah, I got this. I'm totally down with you guys exploiting me. It's totally chill. And I I slowly learned how long it took to make, uh, like, a six-minute uh, narrative film. Oh! Oh! And, uh, That's like a punch to the gut, dude. Yeah. yeah dude. It's like months. Oh. And more like a kick to the teeth. <laughs> uh, but oh, but yeah it uh it was a learning experience i wouldn't do it again but yeah those <laughs> yeah. those were a lot of all-nighters and i don't take pride in those those are not badges mm -hmm. of honor those are badges of stupidity and <laughs> poor time management live and um, learn but you know. if you're working on something personally and you're just feeling yourself and you want to work all night on that yeah live yeah. your life like yeah. do that but yeah. just know that you should not bring that attitude to someone who is paying you because no one yeah. is ever going to pay you enough to work a string of all-nighters they are not entitled to that and don't think that you should give them that because you want to do a good job yeah sacrificing your health isn't worth it 100 percent. no yeah. No job is worth that. Um, uh, yeah. Your art could be if, like, you're a like a masochist. <laughs> <laughs> but don't I'm, don't hurt yourself. I wanted to while while we're on this, I wanted to talk a little bit about your. Uh, do you have a writing process for comics? And then after that, I'd like to ask if you if you get stuck and you can't think of something funny or you can't think of something to write how do you work through that and that's sort of the creative block yeah idea mm -hmm. you know here um but yeah i mean with comics it's story it's jokes it's like how do you how do you stay consistent yeah uh, pumping in, uh, this out? um my approach to comics and animation for personal work is pretty similar uh i just have a, a notes app on my phone and when i have a good idea or if i have a bad idea i always write it down you should always write down all of your ideas preferably right when you get them uh you have it on your phone and i've got this uh primitive ass notes app that i've had for like the last like five years it's very long uh my first ideas that weren't that good enough are still at the top i don't get rid of anything and you scroll and scroll, 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 scroll to the bottom to like the fresh ideas. And I, I usually pull from those. But whenever I have downtime and I'm like, I have like energy and enthusiasm, but I don't have anything that I'm like excited about in that moment, I have a creative block, as one might say. <laughs> I, I, I just go to the notes app and I scroll through it Perfect. and I'm just like, that one's pretty funny. Or, Amazing solution, yeah. That one's yeah. that one's not that good, 
but I think if I switch it some things around, it could be good. Like sometimes. V, do you do you do this yeah. too? Man, that like what you're describing, Alex, is my fantasy world. It's what I <laughs> we just aspire have to. <laughs> it's my like Eden because for me, I have ideas all the time, but I I never have figured a way to stay consistent consistent with my note keeping. I'm very chaotic it's like oh here's a um post-it note i'll just write on on there and then the post-it note gets lost and then sometimes i'll just write on my phone sometimes i'll just write in a google doc and everything is everywhere and i've tried a million things and i've never met and so now i'm just like v, I'm, interesting gonna, to I, I'm gonna give you a present uh, i'm gonna give you <laughs> i i i usually carry around a little a little teeny book a, a little teeny I sketchbook tried that. like this big. Yeah, give them a little book. Sean, I'm going to give you a little book. It's going to fix you. I'm trying to fix I've tried, you. Dude. Just let I've me. Tr <laughs> I've tried fixing myself for 30 years. And I've tried everything. And I've just kind of... I've Wait. just kind of learned to accept that my ideas will just kind of swim around in my brain, and sometimes they'll end up in a notebook. <laughs> uh, Alex, I, I, I was wondering if, it, and you can say no if you want to, oh, but man. I, I, I have, I have my doc up of of random ideas that I write down. Would you, would you be down to pull your doc up? And and just like read like one line from. I'm just curious about how you write your ideas down. Yeah, it's just on my phone. So can I read it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that, that's, okay. what was, that's what I was gonna ask. Yeah. I'm just curious about like like is your like is yours like a fever like a fever dream of random like keywords uh like like you had like uh, a dream <laughs> or like no, or do I, you I write wish, them out very nicely? <laughs> yeah, I wish mine was like more charmingly insane like that, but uh. You know, most of what I do is four panel stuff. Uh, so it's usually, should I just pull it up to the camera? You want to see it? It's like, oh yeah. <laughs> it's just like mostly just four lines of text for the most nice. part. But uh, occasionally there's like a, just like a line that I like wrote while I was high mm -hmm. or something like, Jumanji is released as a real gain. It's immediately <laughs> sold out. There are lines at every store. Uh, I don't, I don't really know what I wanted Dude, to do nice. with that. Yeah. But every, occasionally you just come across like a nugget where it feels like it's written by another guy and you're just like, oh, that guy had a good idea. I think I'm going to steal that. <laughs> yes. Oh, so my, one of my most recent ones is, uh, this isn't even a joke. It says maybe a short about one of those desks with all of the secret drawers in it. Oh. Have you have you ever seen any of those? Have you ever seen those videos where like like you like press a little knob and a new drawer comes out of this like fancy desk and is then that like you the press who, a little thing? Is that like the people who like carve out zucchini and like put like nickels in it and then like seal it over? Is that what you're talking but, about? But but more fancy. It's it's like like it'll be like an old politician's desk and there's like forty drawers deep into secret compartments. And I was oh, watching videos. Tight. I was watching video and like you press a button and like a like a like a, a like a statue will come up from the middle of the desk. <laughs> Just like all kinds <laughs> of crazy stuff. Um <laughs> I like um I have written here instead of an uppercut, a double downer cut. Yo. Uh as an attack. Like the sandwich? Like the KFC sandwich? Oh, no, 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 no. I, just, just like, instead of doing an uppercut, it, it's basically a move that's like... <laughs> and, oh. you, and you, like, try to... Like, I, sometimes I just write down Damn, fight now moves. now you're talking like a real storyboard artist. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I just... Uh, and for anybody watching the doc, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll draw a little person doing a, a double down a cut. But th thank you for sharing uh, a little glimpse into your mind, because very rarely... Do I get to see how people write down their ideas? That's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just got a, a dusty ass text file that I scroll through for new ideas. It's not very fancy. No, but I think it's great though. Yeah, like having that mm -hmm. like that like um discipline of like having an idea and then like writing it down in a spot where you know it's available and yeah like yeah uh hearing yeah. the absolute 
completely unhinged way that you come up with ideas v is uh it's enlightening you know i'm <laughs> i'm 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 perceiving from the other side of the curtain like you know i don't know what goes on on the other end but from what i perceive it's just this ever flowing river of like amazing ideas and content because you're that, <laughs> that you don't record <laughs> yeah you're yeah you're holding down this like ongoing comic that like should be in the louvre and you're Let's also stop. like making like a, a like a short for cartoon network are we allowed to say that you could bleep what i'm saying i don't know yeah um, i actually i don't know it's funny that you say that because i i mean i do no i mean okay i undersold myself i do write down stuff i'm not i'm not, i do write <laughs> i i hold the pencil well, well, you, you have you have designated writing time each week so you like actually sit down at oh. a desk and you and you you take writing time right? i want I, that that sounds cool i i did that actually i did that for a year with like a writing um little group that was really amazing i met them through a writing class and then they were like let's do this and so every day from 7 to 8 p.m we would all hang out on zoom and be just like how are you doing and then all right time to write and we would time each other like it's kind of like um i've heard this was like a pretty common thing to do for sometimes people with like adhd or like you know they're not they're like neurodivergent and it's called body doubling so you have somebody else with you and it kind of helps you just focus um i've stopped doing that mostly because my schedule got crazy but at the end of the day i do feel like structure is very important to me and when i want to write something I need to have the structure figured out. So when I wrote um, my comic, uh, Skylar and Madison, which is what the short is based on, uh, I literally wrote page, I, I write numbers on like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10. And I'm like, page one, exposition, page two, this. I'm very like this. And so for Rodney, I'm very similar. I know that a page should be six panels. Uh, for me, that's the optimal panel count for like a page page, um, kind of like manga, or I've looked at a lot of comics. Sorry, I'm like going on a huge tangent, but maybe hopefully this is interesting. No, I'm, I'm learning how the sausage is made. It's, it's Yeah, it's and I'm very like, I'm very like, okay, like six panels is the optimal panel count because the panels are big enough, the text, and this is the right amount of beats uh, before you turn the page. And I just write one, two, three, four, five, six. I I have to, I have to. I, this is I I have to have that structure. And then I can be like, panel one exposition. How do I set up my page? Um, panel two. I know usually like the the comedic beat should be around panel four because panel four five because then I need panel the last panel of the page to be the cliffhanger. So that's kind of how I think about it. And then I try to fit the elements in the numbers. And if the, oh. and if it doesn't work, sometimes I'm like, the, I love this beat. I think it's funny. It cracks me up, but it has the page dragging on for too long. So I need to get rid of it. So mm -hmm. that's, and, and having the structure helps me gauge whether or not the page works. Cause I've had pages that had eight panels, but for me, I'm like, when I look at them now, I'm like, this is so crammed. There's so much dialogue. It's not very engaging or fun to read. So that's kind of, um, and I, I, I don't know. I do write a lot of, I do a lot of bad takes. I do write a lot of bad dialogue. Dialogue that I'm like, no, <laughs> like nobody <laughs> talks this way. Or like, does someone literally been like, I'm sad. Why did you do this? <laughs> I, right. I think that you can get away with a lot <laughs> in comics dialogue. Because, yeah, like, true. you know, the the best indicator that this is actually bad writing is when a human being is saying it. Like, it, it just feels, like, awkward and clumsy. But when it's just awkward, clumsy text, um, I feel like a reader in their mind is often very forgiving of that. That's true. That is very true. You, you can um, get away yeah. with a lot in the comics format when it comes to dialogue, I feel. I agree with that. I do feel like, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I agree with it because sometimes I, I read like literally before you invited me to the reading, I was like, I 
think I'll read this chapter. And I started reading it out loud to myself. And I was like, oh, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't do this to myself. This is so bad. It sounds so bad. Because I feel like um... to do it justice also, you're now, if you read it out loud, you're tasked with some level of acting to do it justice. So, yeah. like, if, if you're like, uh, you know, if someone's like, you know, I am freaking out. Like, like in the comic, they're probably like, I'm freaking out! Ah! You know, but, like, but if you're at like a, you know, if you're like reading it out loud, like you, you know, it's easy to get subconscious and like, you yeah. Know? And it's also just like, I don't know. I feel like comics, I don't know if you feel that way, Alex, but I feel like something as I've been doing Rodney for a long time and drawing more comics, I have started to notice there is a different timing to comics where it's like when you write an onomatopoeia that will take a little bit longer so like people will read something a little bit more like for example i really don't want to go there freak mm -hmm. and then slide mm -hmm. whoosh and then you get like what the fuck is going on here and like but if you just hear i don't want to go there what the fuck is going on it's kind of, it sounds weird but oh. when you have that timing in between where you've you've kind of arranged your element in a way that like um either there's a lot of details so the person's going to stay on the panel longer or like mm -hmm. these onomatopoeias are like um i think that gives a reading experience that's very different from like pitching a storyboard because i think that's mm -hmm. what and i don't know if you feel that way because you do animation and comics but i do feel like for me every time i switch between comics to animation i have to kind of like switch my gears and I feel like my brain kind of like <laughs> like uh, changing a little bit because it's not exactly it's very similar but it's not exactly the same yeah skills. I think uh the biggest difference between comics and animation in my opinion is just that in animation mm -hmm. you are in control of how long a viewer looks at your stuff mm -hmm. and with comics I think people are usually just like speeding through it. Like you mm -hmm. can lovingly craft a background and like, yeah. you know, draw like a kitchen and have like a, <laughs> like a loaf of bread lovingly rendered on the counter and no one's going to look at it. There might be like one person who is just like drooling over like all your work and is just like, oh, they drew the loaf of bread too. Wow. Yeah. Um, but... We could try to talk in a little loaf of bread visual joke and you're like, I hope <laughs> someone sees my funny bread yeah. pun. <laughs> yeah but you and... know people will pay attention to details though in comics like if you put in like i've noticed like i started it out as a joke and now it became like a big element of my comic but all the like like crude novelty like live left love and like mm -hmm. i even drew a picture of like the marilyn monroe's by warhol but like i imagined in my head it was the one that you buy for like ten dollars at like <laughs> a, you know a gift shop yeah uh like that kind of stuff people will like pick up on it though so it's not Sometimes yeah, of, you gotta draw the look. Like it because yeah. your readers love you, V. They <laughs> they uh, comb through every single panel that you draw. Like a, they can't like, get enough. In dark chocolate. <laughs> they sniff it's, it. The, they the, it's delicious. <laughs> have you have you ever seen that video of um? It's the the guy who uh, is an expert taste tester, and he's te he's Whoa. testing ice he's testing um an ice cream scoop, and he's like. Well, when you want to when you want to taste and you get the full flavor profile, you uh you, you put a little scoop on your tongue, you uh put it right on the particular part of your tongue, and and then you go, <laughs> and the whole video is him just over and over again, and then you swirl it to the side a little bit and you go, <laughs> and it's just this like like little old guy in like a taste test lab, and that's how I imagine your fans, like like when they get the little scraps of comics here and there that you can force out on top of your 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 day job v you know all your fans like 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 they, they just like smashing it to bits with their tongue until there's nothing left you know, chewing sean's it 200 got, times sean's got access to these corners of the internet that i don't and i want in hold on i'll send i'll send the video uh you guys can keep talking <laughs> <laughs> that's so crazy but um i don't you know this is an episode about Alex, and I <laughs> want to ask Alex more questions. Unfortunately, we have a ton of listeners who ask us really great questions. Hell yeah. So that's the moment when um, 
we get the listeners. So if you're a Patreon, you uh, a Patreon, you can like uh, ask questions on the scores. Obviously, you can ask on Twitter and Instagram. So I'm going to start with the patrons. Uh, okay, so from our patron Katie, in your opinion, uh, what makes an illustration humorous? Alex, what's your take on a humorous drawing? I think a humorous drawing is humor pulling tutorial. from. Yeah, this is a humor right tutorial now, step by step uh, <laughs> a humorous drawing is coming from a lived experience you're you're sharing a little bit of yourself in it and that might be like a, a representational drawing of like oh yeah people are always ordering this at cafes or yeah some people like stand like this and you and those who know know if you know you know <laughs> uh it's just you know you're you're sharing a little bit of a truth that you see and you are trying to find other people who see the world similarly uh mm. uh something truly funny probably isn't going to unite the entire world <laughs> uh it's like yeah. a, yeah. <laughs> it's it's like unless a weird, it's a fart joke unless it's a fart joke because that's like a human experience that we can't get away from. It's like an inside joke that you have with yourself that you're trying to get someone else on board with or something. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the more niche the joke, the danker the meme. <laughs> and the more that. rewarding it's going to be for when someone gets it. They're going to be like, ah, yeah. I, I get that reference. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. You know, like. If I just wanted to connect to like the widest amount of people ever all the time, I would just write jokes about cats and weed. Like those <laughs> that's like those are like the talk about playing to the masses. There we go. Yeah, that's like the broadest blanket you can cast, but you're still like sharing truths about those two things. Just like mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, sometimes my cat is annoying or <laughs> sometimes weed makes me sleepy. Every time I make a short with a baby in it, it does like four times better than anything I ever make. Like, it's just like if, it's, if, if there's a cute baby in it, like everybody's like, yeah, like on, especially especially on TikTok. If it's like a cute baby. They love it. Uh, are you a people watcher? Do, do, you, do you like do you like sit in a cafe and just like look at weird stuff people do and like, like I mean, take note of it? Like that kind of yeah. stuff? Yeah. I feel like I'm in one of the best cities for people watching. 100 percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone is just pushed together and yeah. uh there's a lot of like assimilation from that so you can just be on the subway and look at someone that you would never share an experience with otherwise mm -hmm. uh it's one of the many reasons why i choose to not leave new york is great i mean i've only been there for like traveling or like you know like sightseeing or whatever it's such a cool city so oh, you should you come back uh yeah. we'll, we'll do another comic reading Oh, that would be so fun. <laughs> oh, but before we move before we move on from this, I just want to ask if there's uh what what's the funniest like sort of character or situation or people watching scenario that you've seen in New York? Huh. Can you think can you think of one that like stands out that you just saw like <laughs> that you're like that's a funny character or something? Uh yeah, I don't I don't know if this qualifies, but there's one time me and two friends were eating um peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in Washington Square Park. We got it from this expensive peanut butter and jelly store called Peanut Butter Company. The sandwiches were good. I, I wouldn't go there more than once, but they closed, so it's not even a thing anymore. But anyway, so we were eating our sandwiches in the park, and there was this one arrogant little squirrel that just wouldn't leave us alone and like wouldn't get out of our business, and we had to like shoo it away a lot. And it this was like over like 15 minutes, and eventually the squirrel just darts at my friend Chelsea and grabs like the last like quarter of the sandwich that they were eating and like runs off. And we were all just uh we were uh, flabbergasted by <laughs> this. And uh, across like the walkway there was like this one uh like homeless dude leaning on a shopping cart who was just like that squirrel is pregnant. And uh, we like looked over our shoulder and was just like, what? What did you just say? And he's just like, that squirrel isn't 
fighting for itself. It's fighting for a kid. Like I know, I know a pregnant squirrel when I see one. That's and that my squirrel wife. is pregnant. <laughs> but yeah. um, I I was touched by it because that definitely came from a, a lived experience. This is a guy who's in that park every day and, obs- and is observing squirrel patterns. I am merely a guest in that park. I I am not as learned as he is. And when he said that the squirrel was pregnant, I believe him. And I started crying. I just tears <laughs> streamed down my face and and landed and salted. And the string swelled. <laughs> they, my, my peanut butter jelly sandwich tasted salty from my tears as I oh. shoveled it into my mouth. Oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> that was crazy because there was like rev- like it was just like a twist after another twist. It's like not only did he steal the sandwich, but then you have like the input. It's like from the homeless guy that's just like changes your perspective and. It's like, can't be mad at the squirrel anymore. Yeah, he uh, asked if he wanted to play chess afterwards. Uh, Did you? Nah, I've. And then, I, and then he's, I've... and then he stole my sandwich, and he was like, "I'm pregnant. Leave me alone." <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wish that I was a chess guy because, like, I wanted to cap the story with that, but uh, that I would have just dope. been asking questions the whole time, and it would have been <laughs> annoying, and he would have just asked me to leave, and it would have yeah, been yeah. awkward. We can go back, get back to the to, to the uh the questions from from, from <laughs> yeah, the patrons. Yeah, yeah. I'm I, sorry, I I just I was curious about. I was like, this is like New York, and your people watching, like, there's probably something funny there. <laughs> this one's from Brother to Drummer. I think that could be an interesting one for comics. Um, which is like, um, I'm gonna rephrase the question a little bit. Um, like. How much time do you allow yourself for a joke to pay off? Like kind of like, I think I kind of want to like bring that back to your list of, uh, you know, of ideas. Like maybe what's the longest time you've had like an idea sit in your notes app and then huh. manage to like get it to work in a comic? Oh, okay. So the question is like, how long do you let an idea cook for? Or... Yeah, that's kind of how I want to, it's kind of how, how okay. Wanna what's the furthest extent like did you have like eight years you dug up a note and we're like oh i could make something out of it. i don't know right i'm also like, interested in this because you said that you always have the oldest jokes at the top or like yeah. oldest line and that would drive me bananas when there's yeah. something that's <laughs> like how <laughs> no i definitely feel a little bananas all the time um <laughs> i i just do that because you know you just build from the bottom like a regular text file but I think mm-hmm. that the longest that I've done a joke for, or I, I've pulled a joke back from, is probably like four or five years. Like a long time. Wow! Yeah. Um, you know, they're not all bangers. But there was one time where I, I drew a comic once. It was like a four panel um, about me going on a subway and sitting. And the subway is just stalling. And it's not going anywhere. And I don't know where it's going. I'm just sitting there. And a guy comes in and he says, like, hey, is this uh, train going to Queens? And I'm like, I don't know. And he's like, so you're you're just sitting here? And I'm like, uh, it's it's hot outside and there's air conditioning <laughs> in here. And then he yeah. says, that's fair. And then he sits down next to me. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's the joke. But I revisited that like three years later. And I was like, oh, I remember that guy. I want to make a short film about him. And I uh, made like a little three minute short with some of my friends about this one gag that I drew from like many years ago. So uh, I, I think the takeaway is just don't be embarrassed uh, revisiting jokes that you feel are still good. I I agree. I feel also like, you know, um, the longest you keep an idea in your brain even if you're not like actively working on it I do feel like it does get better uh like you know you're not always thinking about it but I think your brain is like doing a lot of like um not offline but like it's just kind of like still Rubik's cubing it (laughs) in the (laughs) back of your brain and I I think that's really true I, I had something similar happen where um I had written this song 
uh, this like funny song, like a little techno song. It was called Basement Dad Fashion Show. And it's <laughs> just like it uh, at, at the beginning of the song, it like works its way up. And, it, and then it, there's a whispering voice that says, Boke, what your daddy gave you. And then it's like Basement Dad Fashion Show. But like, so I had this song and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing with this. I don't know what it is. But I had this opportunity lo- uh, like like four years ago to uh, like two years had gone by. I pitched it to super deluxe as a short where this father is suspected of cheating on his on his family but really he's going to these underground dad themed high fashion raves where all these (laughs) fathers wear like like high fashion uh costumes of like like classic like dad father like whatever like fire like hot fireman costumes and stuff and um like big crocs shoes like whatever and they were like uh (laughs) They were like, this is not, this is, this is not for us. And I was like, uh, fair, that's okay. But then like three, <laughs> th- three years passed by after that. And I had an opportunity to make some bumpers with Adult Swim. And they were like, hey, we need a Rick and Morty uh, advertisement for the new season. Mm. And I was like, what if, what if Morty walks into the basement and his father is like doing this this basement dad fashion show thing and i and i did it and and, and it turned into like a a bumper that airs but that was like seven years (laughs) that that song was sitting around (laughs) (laughs) that rules yeah Uh, that's awesome yeah i think that's further proof that uh you should never abandon the good ideas even if you feel like it's from a different era of your life i agree i agree because um, basement dad fashion show, that's evergreen. That's ever- <laughs> that's that's always gonna hit. And probably another seven years, you can pull that back, and uh, yeah, give it a second life. People are always gonna have dads, and always gonna have basements. And fashion's always no gonna in- exist. Yeah. Actually, in uh, LA, there aren't really basements. That's so, hmm. Not yeah. not a lot of them, at least. Yeah, that's true. I never it thought really of... makes you think. It... I never thought it of does. That yeah, I guess most basements are converted cellars, right? So that that's probably uh uh more present in uh early American architecture. Yeah, that's that my, makes sense. That's my uninformed oh. guess. Also, earthquakes, maybe. I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Too many people. Too many people are hanging out in their man caves down in the basement watching UFC, and then an earthquake <laughs> happens and it <laughs> collapses on them. Oh, that makes me think of my dad. <laughs> yeah, I, I just I just picture a dad just sitting in the basement, the building collapse on them, and then a ref ca- uh, runs in and like counts them out like a UFC match. Like he's pinned. <laughs> Yeah. That's my comic there... idea. I gotta write that down. Yeah. <laughs> That's also evergreen. From uh from our patron Bialin's Bear, uh okay, this is an interesting one. Uh Uh-oh. if you're down to chop shop, what's the key to making a webcomic be successful or mm. profitable? Uh, <laughs> so I the second part I'm still trying to figure out. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I could do both. Uh the secret to making a webcomic successful is post consistently yes uh it <laughs> doesn't have to be that good uh it doesn't yeah it the, the most important thing is just do it consistently um if all you can do is hold down once a week that's fine just do it once a week if all you can do it is once every two weeks that's fine the most important thing is that you're doing it consistently and readers know when they can expect another uh comic coming up um because do you have a backlog of posts like do you, do you as a safety um uh, all i really have is uh stuff i post on patreon first like for early mm-hmm. access okay and i usually do it like a week in, like you know weeks in a week in advance but sometimes i just like post a bunch of it and I won't post it for like months. And when I know I'm busy, like with a job or something, and I just don't have time to draw comics, I just like pull into the backlog and do that. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's only if I'm bored, 
I'm not working on anything else and I'm just drawing a bunch of comics, I know now that it will benefit me in the future. It's like my, mm-hmm. my like bunker of canned food that will survive me, uh, 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 the apocalypse of too much work or whatever. I, I'll work more on this metaphor. I do like that we're staying in the basement. Um, <laughs> like the bunker. <laughs> yeah. But the bunker. Now, now it's like a bunker prep, like apocalypse. <laughs> yeah. Time, like yeah. Basement dad apocalypse <laughs> bunker. <laughs> Yeah, Prepper Dad Fashion Show also has Ooh. something there, I think. Yes, yes please. Sign me up. Um, for making it profitable, though, um, there's a couple routes you can take. You can uh, be ver- you can ha- you can run a very prolific shop and just like crank out like shirts with your characters and like little mugs and beach balls and thongs and like you could be like creative <laughs> with it um you can look for sponsors uh mm. I, i'm i'm kind of trying to live that sponsor life now uh because i don't think that there's any shame in saying that this podcast is brought to you by google uh, yeah <laughs> because I don't know. I'm kind of of the belief that like a huge corporation should fund uh passionate little art projects before uh before like I don't know fellow broke ass comic readers. Um I'm very grateful for all of my patrons obviously. They help me pay the bills when uh funds are tight. But mm. um I think that previous anti-ad generations vilified people who sought sponsorships because they were sellouts but Mm. i feel like these corporations have immeasurable amounts of money that should be going to fund people's projects it's not cool to have more than one chicken nugget that you're eating on the daily (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah, that's what I, you you know you're not a punk anymore. <laughs> I I'm I'm totally fine with uh losing punk cred if it means <laughs> I get like McDonald's money. Like I don't I don't give a shit. Uh like I'll still be doing like community efforts. I will be like doing my like DIY show booking and like contributing mm. to mutual aid. I'm always going to do that. I'm going to be a good Samaritan, but if I can suck on ronald mcdonald's teat i will totally <laughs> do that if it means i don't have to ask my readers for money anymore if, if you had yeah. to write a strip about sucking on ronald mcdonald's teat and it's a mcdonald's advertisement how do you feel what would what's the angle that you come from uh i would be very proud that i somehow convinced uh their like social media marketing manager to pay me to make smut ah! true i think that would do well huh. yeah internet <laughs> yeah i mean my reach is mostly like accessing like freaks whose brains have been poisoned by being online too much so much like myself so yeah i think that <laughs> yeah. they saw ronald mcdonald's titties uh they'd probably go out and buy a mcdouble <laughs> i know i would i think that's really funny. Sometimes I wonder about, you know, um, if, I don't know, the people on social media, who, who is that crowd, you know, like, who are they? Are they, what's their life like? Are they normies or are they just all like us, like children of the internet? You know what I mean? Um, like, normies? You uh, know, like, it's all valid questions. I, uh, are we the, normies? I don't think on, we're normies. I mean, on the full spectrum of regular guy and like total batshit weirdo uh i'm probably closer to normal guy i i have a <laughs> i have a job kind of uh i have uh, i have a girlfriend who i love uh i have a house uh, Shout out to those love. are all those are all pretty normy things that's uh, true i think as far as um a social media audience goes i think one of the few beautiful things about social media is that like the following you have is often a reflection of yourself because that is very true because there are people who flock to you because of what you make and what you put out there 
Uh, so if I make a bunch of comics about Super Smash Brothers, chances are a lot of my readers are also going to enjoy uh, the occasional three stock 1v1 no items match. Well, they might do items, you know. Uh, I'm not that much of a purist. <laughs> Oh man! Sometimes I wish I was more well versed in Super Smash Bros. Don't do um, it. It's, <laughs> it ruins lives. Uh, I've lost. Also, a lot of those guys are like pretty, pretty smelly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. There's a uh, if you go to like like Super Smash Brothers tournaments, like yeah. like I, I would say as far as ranking smelliness, like you have like like Magic the Gathering tournaments. And then you have <laughs> Super Smash. I used, and don't I, get me I wrong, I like of both of those I, things. <laughs> I I went to a couple, not like big time, um, Magic the Gathering tournaments, but I went to a couple because I used to feel really into it. That's, That's cool. I I wanted to get into Magic the Gathering because I got a lot of friends who are into it, but it, it's just there's a lot of uh prerequisite investments required yeah yeah, yeah. money yeah. yeah yeah just investing That's... in decks and cards and yeah. yeah and then also time because you have to always keep up with like what's the new rules and stuff so it's like it's kind of hard to stay up to date with the game um like yeah it's like a commitment uh i kind of wanted to ask a couple questions we got from instagram yeah. because Ooh, hey everyone instagram. We are on Instagram as well now. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to Twitter in a couple of months. So please follow <laughs> us on Instagram <laughs> and uh, ask questions smart. there. Um, and so we have uh, a really, we kind of touched on that earlier, but I do kind of want to have you really kind of uh, break that down for us from Wisconsin Bird Library. How do you budget your time and money huh. with... I, I don't know about the second part of the question, which goes with such an unstable income stream. Do you feel like your income stream is very unstable? Uh, I would say chaotic. I wouldn't say okay. unstable. Yeah. Um, it's, it's more stable this year, which is cool. I think when I exclusively worked in ads, it was chaotic. Like I would mm. take a job for like six weeks where the, the day rate was fat and juicy and I raked it in. And I knew that this is my nest egg. And as much as I I want to buy me and my girlfriend sashimi for dinner every single night because, mm -hmm. like, uh, this mm -hmm. month I'm a high roller, I know I can't <laughs> do that. Uh, I think you, can, you can't pivot to living fancy just because you got one good paycheck. Mm hmm yeah know that there will be a famine in the future and you gotta <laughs> you gotta i gotta pull back in this bunker metaphor we've been developing there will yeah. be a famine there yeah, absolutely there must be and it's coming yeah I, I think it's a little different <laughs> i think it's i think it's a little different for you guys because uh you strike me both as like tv people and yeah. uh you're on uh productions for entire seasons and your bases are covered for like half a year or something but mm. in advertising everything is very uh fast paced quick turnaround mm. maybe you're booked for like a couple of days if you're lucky you're booked for a couple of weeks but um you're paid you're paid well in advertising and uh you'll you'll make a lot of money one month and then the next month you might not have anything so you kind of have mm -hmm. to always have the mindset that this paycheck that you get might be your last one for a long time. Yeah. Uh, so you always kind of have to be budgeting a little bit. Especially uh, in New because, York. It's expensive. Yeah. New York. Yeah, baby. Uh, <laughs> uh, chopped cheeses are sometimes nine bucks at the deli uh, if you get a hero. So uh, it's not it's not easy out here. But yeah, uh, I guess like my advice is be prepared. <laughs> yeah. At all times, or you can I don't know move move to L.A. where you can work in TV and have a union, and uh, that's probably a little a little bit less stressful. 
It's also very expensive here, and all the shows have gotten canceled. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so there's there's problems everywhere. <laughs> yeah, no, I think yeah. like uh, animation is uh, getting hit all across the board because like I know I see on Twitter that uh, shows are getting canceled, but I think in in New York there's a lot of ad houses that are uh, mm-hmm. downsizing a little bit because uh, they were feeling they they were feeling themselves a little bit in 2020 and they were like oh everyone wants animation now because we don't have live action so all these places like expanded they got new office buildings they uh hired a bunch of staff and then all of a sudden uh things open up again and live action is back and all of these ad studios have these like big facilities that they can't maintain anymore because Mm -hmm. they're not responsible for all content anymore so a lot of ad studios have pivoted to having live action branches, which is dumb and mm. not why people hire these places, but I understand that they have to do it. But it means that a lot of uh, animator friends of mine just like don't have work right now because there, uh, there was like a high demand for a long period. A lot of people were like, oh, I can quit my full-time job because – uh, I'm getting hit up for full-time work all the time. And mm-hmm. then a year passes, and uh, everyone's kind of scratching their heads wondering, uh, what the hell are we going to do now? So I'm hoping that this is just a wave that will pass, and everyone will like find their footing, and uh, people can maintain the freelance careers that they had before. But for the time being, uh, I've been focusing more on comics, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got a book deal, which is pretty tight, um, and it's covering my bases so for a while. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I uh, back in October, a collection of my Loud and Smart web comics got published as a collection by Silver Sprocket. Um, Woo! Yeah, Woo! that was great. Uh, Silver Sprocket is an amazing publisher. Check out their stuff if you don't know it. Um, I, I love everyone on that staff. Uh, they really care about their artists. And uh, I went on a book tour for that. Uh, and I did readings across the West Coast, and you know I did all that myself. I I I did it like very DIY style, but I think that promotion was very good for me, and it mm-hmm. helped my proposals for future books. And uh, one of them got picked up. I don't think I could say much about it yet, but uh, mm. uh, like I said, it's gonna cover my bases for a while, so I I don't think I have to hustle as hard in animation. So you heard it here first, folks. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> it'll be out in two years, which is crazy. Whoa, that's publishing, insane. publishing moves so slow. Once again, yeah. my brain is poisoned and uh, the immediate gratification from posting to social media has just made me want things to happen like right now. But dude, that's um, something that I relate to so much. I'm like, so scared of ever putting out a book because you're just like doing it on your own nobody sees it I mean I guess besides like your editor or whatever yeah when you're when you publish something online you get not only like the immediate reaction from everybody but on top of that you also get all of their thoughts and stuff you can also delete the post yeah if if you're embarrassed of it (laughs) yeah that's true but it's there's this thing where you can also kind of like I feel like for me, publishing a webcomic, sometimes I, I, I'm I sort of going a direction and that direction is way too obvious. And I'm like, I can't go there anymore because everybody's already like figured it out. So I can just like like rewrite my, yeah. my, my plans. But if you're making your book, then and you're like, well, that first in, intention that I had, I'm going to follow it through. And then everybody's like picking up the book and they're like, I don't know. That scares yeah. me. That's really scary. Uh. I think, like, the the most intimidating thing about it is making sure that, like, the quality is consistent. Mm-hmm. Like, working on something for a year means, like, you have to just be good from the get-go and, like, hold mm-hmm. it down for that long. And I feel like as a webcomic artist who is just, like, figuring out and he's going along and, like, all my readers are along for the ride, uh, I'd like to think that I get better every month. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm definitely better at drawing now than I was a year ago. And if I have a book that I have to look 
at finishes that I did a year ago when I'm fin when I'm finalizing it. That sounds really hard. Are, are you <laughs> yeah, are you able yeah. to to scramble around the 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 th the drawings so that you're starting with something that you finish towards the end of the year and and uh, you're not it's sort of like scramble up your it's so it's not chronological. Yeah, my my buddy Tyler Boss, who's like another comic artist and writer, uh, gave me like a genius tip once, which is just like start in the beginning, uh, because like your first few pages of the graphic novel should like make people's jaw drop. Like it should be like your best work because it's the first impression. Uh, if they get to the middle of the book, they're probably along for the ride already. And if it's like a little rough around the edges, uh, that will be the most forgiving place in the mm -hmm. story. Uh, you want the beginning and the end to like really wow you. So I think I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna take a tip from his book and do something similar. Yeah, if yeah. you ever run out of time, um, just work yeah. it into the story of the comic that you, you all the color is gone. You're out. Oh of yeah, Joan and Vasquez yeah. loved doing that when I uh, was reading. Uh, what Meta. is it? Yeah, yeah. He Johnny was the doing that. Homicidal maniac is that? Is that? Yeah, it was. It was either that or in like the Happy Noodle Boy strips, where sometimes he would just give these uh, very transparent vignettes of how like overworked and stressed he was trying <laughs> to meet this deadline for the book, and like my like. 14 year old ass is just reading the comic just being like being a comic artist sounds so fun <laughs> yeah. I, I, I feel like he went from feeling a little bit mysterious to like he streams on twitch like three days a week and i just yeah. like, I just listen to him like play fortnite <laughs> and, yeah. like, uh, and I, I or draw like... I feel like in our modern era, being mysterious doesn't pay anymore. Yeah. Uh, like, you kind of have to unless be in you, the public eye. Unless you, like, hide a specific part of your personality. Like, there was, like, this YouTuber, like, what's his name? Uh, that was wearing a mask or whatever. Um, or, like, the VTubers, where it's just kind of like, mm -hmm. here is my That's little true. project yeah like this is my projected self and then you get to guess what i really look like um, playing a character yeah 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 Even yeah, like when, um yeah Kid v, when you're on tiktok you like put on that alligator mask that's kind of yeah. like the same thing i just i think for me i just don't want i don't know this is so stupid but i don't want people to deep fake me i don't want that to happen to me ever uh um, wouldn't it. it be a little flattering for the first time no, no. Oh, okay. I, that, it, that also, it also depends on what the deep fake is. There's there's oh, yeah, weird deep no, fakes fair. happening. Even like <laughs> for me, even something as small as like uh, okay, this is a story. I think this is the first time I'm saying it publicly. Ooh. Um, ooh. Uh, but <laughs> I worked on the Loud House, as uh, some people know, and I worked the first three seasons. And a lot of cartoon shows they end up uh doing cameos of the crew as incidental characters and when i moved to la finally it was sometime halfway through season two um they gave me an incidental that was in the lot like like staying in the line at the mall and, and unfortunately i guess like the character was like biting her lip like texting and it became this thing on DeviantArt and they're calling her mall cutie and there's all these like slightly sexy art of her and Whoa. I that wait and, and it was based off so of much. you and it's based off of me oh, and I'm just God. like now I have this thing that if I ever get a show or anything or like even my comics I'm never putting cameos of anyone like I'm sorry because oh. <laughs> I hate this so much <laughs> um <laughs> I'm like, I like, I think about it sometimes. I'm like, <laughs> it's just like, I don't know. It's nasty. Yeah. Uh, I, so. I feel like that, uh, that separation though allows you to maybe feel like less violated by it. But <laughs> it's I, I, true. Under I understand that you, you know, still hate it. I'm I, like, I love attention. So I feel like if I were mall cutie and, uh, <laughs> People online were like shipping me with, uh, I don't know, uh, like the main character of Lincoln. Yeah, Loud. yeah, one of the, uh, yeah, one of the main characters. Uh, 
like I said, the first time would be flattering. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that if if it's going to be something that happens, I think it's got to be something that you're doing on purpose and want to do. For instance, there's a new TikTok short that's going to be coming out that I animated that's Ooh. basically a version of me that um is trying to romance mother nature and i'm oh yeah almost, and i'm almost naked in most of it and uh are you like, are you like fucking a tree or is that uh, a spoiler kind of so, sort 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 of like i uh, it's like i'm i'm diving headfirst into the trussy you know like i'm <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a lot of like it's like a lot of like me laying on the grass with giant beady dew drops on me and like little grass hands or like touch and it, it's cool. the, and, and i sing a song that's like like nature i need you right now but <laughs> not just as a friend i need a lover and like um and i'm aware that i'm putting this thing out there and this perception of me that hopefully it's just sort of like cute and and no one like i mean like i draw myself as this sort of like dumpy little you know naked guy running around you never see anything but like it, it it's like there's always like a plant covering you know what i mean <laughs> like yeah. but 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 you know i am putting this thing out there and there's going to be people that are like what the fuck is this shit or like or there's going to be some people that are like i don't know screen save it <laughs> like they screenshot yeah, like... it and they're like you know, <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah, yeah maybe I... I wonder, I don't know, not to get into like a whole controversy, but I also Ooh. feel like when you're like assigned like female at birth, it's kind of like, it's going to be a little it's, weird. It's different. That's, it's different. that's <laughs> totally yeah. fair. I think yeah. that uh, uh, but, mask know. people uh, aren't uh, barraged with uh, the gaze as much. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think like if uh, like Sean or me sees like some fan art of us uh, banging a fictional character. It's maybe like a, a little more novel and flattering uh, yeah. because we don't have to deal 100%. with this shit every single day. <laughs> I, I also just want to call out that Mall Cutie. Uh, <laughs> I, I did look it up. <laughs> I did look it up, and I I am looking at it. It I think the 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 weirdest part is that it does seem to be an underage girl, which makes it worse, which makes uh, it weirder that, that people are like, but I, I will say that it, that is a mistake of the, of the, the designer on that show to like, you have to know how making like someone bite their lip is going to look if it's a female character. Yeah. Like you, you know, yeah, I so, think for, but, for kids television, you're just not allowed to have the characters bite their lip. It's if you like, design that and you're listening to this, we're fucking coming for you. B yeah, and me just... and the whole Bunker Squad. The Apocalypse <laughs> Bunker Squad is bunker coming squad. with our. Uh, we're coming with our non-perishables and our uh, <laughs> apocalyptic scrap metal armor and weaponry, and we're taking you down, buddy. You know, a can of crushed tomatoes hits pretty hard if I throw it from far enough away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I have a can of preserved poison that one time I mixed up with with my something I was, that I was eating and I ate a little bit of it and I, I almost died but I do have half a can of poison still Oh my god this is <laughs> thing Yeah um, so uh this Alex... is a a whole threat that we're No, no I'm just kidding here So I think uh i i really like this question it's kind of fun and maybe also a good way to tie it back to the beginning of this episode from cat underscore scratch what do you listen to when you work podcast shows or music or all of them i i guess all of them but i only really listen to podcasts or i watch shows when I'm doing like mindless tedium, like when I was talking about the miserable rotoscope rotoscope job before, uh, I I just listen to like a lot of podcasts and I uh, like listen to a lot of like television shows that I've seen already, and it's the same thing when I'm animating or I'm inking comics, but when I have to make creative decisions, like I'm storyboarding a shot or I'm uh I'm like writing for a comic or an anim or an animated short. 
I, I can't really listen to anything. I yeah. need, mm-hmm. I might be able to like listen to music that reinforces the vibe of mm-hmm. what I'm writing, but I can only listen to podcasts when I am not making any decisions. And I found myself listening to less podcasts and watching less shows because I am animating less this year. I'm, mm. I'm writing for a book and I am writing presentations and curriculum for students. Mm-hmm. So I, I have to, I have to be on, I have to use my entire brain. So I'm consuming less media because of that. And it bums me out because mm-hmm. I love media. And I love content, and I just love devouring it from my mm. internet trough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, when I when I write and I have to like make decisions, I just I I don't listen to much. Yeah, very much agreed. That's also me. I feel like the only thing I can listen to when I write is the same like chill background lo-fi or like chill jazz the kind of jazz you would hear <laughs> yeah. at like the starbucks <laughs> oh yeah. yeah yeah i i default to uh lo-fi beats pretty often if i'm feeling I, I like a... class oh go ahead no, no 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 please 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 uh if i'm feeling classy i'll do like uh like new javes or something you know like mm-hmm. something that feels a little bit less like it came out of a machine but yeah. <laughs> but it's still it's still like background noise uh i was gonna say um if anybody ever wants to listen to a fun playlist to to work to i collaborated with like 15 different musicians uh and i animated a loop uh uh for um this playlist called lo-fi beats to piss and shit to and everybody (laughs) made pee pee and poo poo sounding beats um Uh. fart noises in them and uh so if anybody ever wants to just like you know, listen and just chill without uh, something without like lyrics and just like relax. Like you can listen to that if you want to. It's on YouTube. Uh, I bet yeah. that sounds sick. I only groaned because like I I, I hate pee pee poo poo humor so much. Uh, <laughs> I bet the, I bet the music is is fire. Uh, this this uh when people like repeat words, it's like it has it's like it's infantile to me. Oh, pee pee and poo poo. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, you said it again. People <laughs> and just... with that, <laughs> before, <laughs> before this turns but... into a melee, <laughs> a before, street fight over Before Super I Bowl. activate all of Alex's pet peeves. <laughs> <laughs> what if this were the end of this creative? <laughs> <laughs> no, cut, cut out what I said. I want to hype what, uh, what no, Sean No, 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 please. Disparage it, please don't (laughs) encourage me. I have my ego has is already inflated, so I need some some people to drag me back down to earth. (laughs) I um I think that's a good point to uh end the the episode. And then Alex, thanks for being our guest and sharing your story. Uh, thanks for bringing me on the show. Um, I never thought it would happen, but I'm 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 honored to be here. Truly. Like I said, I've been a fan. Uh, I've just been a fan for a long time, and it means a lot that uh, I got to be on here and chill with y'all. It's so crazy, because I feel like, I don't know, it's like, uh, the feeling is mutual. So, thanks for coming on the show. I feel very lucky to have uh, gotten to have a conversation with you. I'm a fan of your comics and your work. I think you're a very funny guy. And I was very excited to have a conversation with you today. Likewise. We're all getting real, y'all. Oh, and also, <laughs> I just want to give a shout out to our listeners. Follow us on Twitter at CRTB Block, where we ask for drawing prompts and questions to ask our guests. Huge thanks to our editor, Clemens, for editing the podcast, and Malik for helping us produce the show. If you love our show, follow us on Instagram. We haven't written that in the end of the show. And if yet. you hate the uh, show, follow us there, too. Yes, it's uh, the Instagram handle is a little different. It's CRTV dot block. 
So follow us there. Um, it's fun and we share more drawings. I think uh, the Instagram platform is a really great place to follow the show. Uh, if you love our show, then support us on Patreon as well. Becoming a patron gets you early access to interviews as well as bonus episodes. It helps us pay for things like the drive or the Zoom or our amazing editor and producer. We need to feed them more than one chicken nugget to survive exactly. a weekend. We, so we need your help. Chicken nugget fund on the Patreon, please, today. <laughs> well, we work on Google, but, you know, um, <laughs> some things take a while. So, <laughs> like the link in the description of this episode, I have been your host, V. And I've been your host, Sean. Keep being crib, and we'll see you next week, baby! <laughs> Bunker Squad! Bunker, Bunker Squad! Squad.